I've been teaching biology a long time and in my experience one thing that really confuses a lot of students when they start looking at Mendelian genetics is dihybrid crosses and particularly dihybrid test crosses when we use those to determine whether the two gene loci are linked or independently assorted. So what I want to do in this screencast is hopefully demystify that for you. We're going to have a look at two, sorry, three phenotypes, um, two which are on the same chromosome and one that's on a separate chromosome. So we can see how, that, how this plays out. To start with, um, let me introduce you to one mouse phenotype. This is called the grasshopper phenotype. It's called the grasshopper phenotype because if you pick one of these mice up by the tail, um, it'll sort of alternately kick its legs apart and then clench them together. And when they walk, um, you'll see if you have a look at this mouse over here, um, when they when they walk, they sort of they lift their legs higher than a normal mouse would. They have this sort of strange bounding gait when they walk, um, which looks a little bit grasshopperish, I suppose. In any case, these mice have an autosomal recessive phenotype. And um, in other words, in order to have the grasshopper phenotype, a mouse would have to be homozygous for the little g allele. Another phenotype, which is on a separate chromosome, that the grasshopper phenotype is on, the, on chromosome 14. Um, the prune phenotype is on chromosome 19. It's on a separate chromosome. Again, it's an autosomal recessive phenotype. You'd have to be homozygous recessive, little p, little p, in order to have the prune phenotype. Um, wouldn't you love to have one of these mice? They've got sort of wrinkly skin um, and no hair. Um, in any case, so that's the prune phenotype, not linked. It's independently assorted from the grasshopper phenotype. Now, the way that we can test whether these are on the same chromosome or not, um, even though we all, I'm already telling you that they're not, but the way that we can test that is by doing what we call a test cross. Now, a test cross is when we take one mouse, which is heterozygous at both gene loci, that is, it's big P, little p, big G, little g, and we cross it with a mouse that's homozygous for both gene loci, homozygous recessive at both gene loci. Um, you can see this mouse is prune skinned and also it has the grasshopper gait as well. Now where a lot of students come unstuck at this point is they, they look and they see well, there's four letters in the genotype and there's four spaces across the top of the Punnett square. So it sort of seems to make intuitive sense that you would write those four letters in the four spaces, doesn't it? But if you do that, what you're failing to recognize is that across the top of the Punnett square here, we don't do that, that's, that's not going to get anywhere. What, what we're writing across the top of the Punnett square here is a simulation, M-E-I, meiosis, and we're, writing, we're simulating meiosis across the top and down the side of the Punnett square, and inside the Punnett square, we're doing a simulation of fertilization. Okay, if you bear that in mind, it'll, it'll help you a lot to not get unstuck. So let's look and see what we really do. Let's have a look at these chromosomes. Now, this is our heterozygous mouse, our mouse that's heterozygous at both gene loci. You can see it's big G, little g, big P, little p. There are, of course, two alleles because these chromosomes have replicated for meiosis. Um, when this pair of homologous chromosomes separates at anaphase 1 in meiosis, um, the big G and the big P go to one pole of the cell, they become a daughter cell, and the little g and the little p will go to another. And of course, they'll then further divide um, in each case to provide two gametes. So we end up with four gametes altogether. Two of those are going to have a big G and a big P, and two will have a little g and a little p. Okay, Both dominant traits. The, both the alleles for both dominant traits in, in half the sperm and the alleles for the recessive traits in the other half of the sperm. So back on our Punnett square, that's what we write in here. We write that half the sperm are going to have both alleles for the dominant traits, for prune skin and, and grasshopper, and in fact they'll have a normal trait. The other half will have the allele for prune skin and for grasshopper trait, for actually having those traits, the re those recessive phenotypes. 50% will have this. Of course, this mouse here can only produce gametes with the recessive phenotypes. Okay, So that's what we write in here. But what about these other two spaces? Well, here's the thing. 
If you look at these, this pair of chromosomes, I mean, what's to say that they line up that way? I mean, the chromosomes just come to the equator of the cell from wherever they happen to be in the cell. And, you know, there's no reason why um, big G and big P should end up on the same side of the cell. They could just as easily have lined up like this. Um, or in fact, they could have lined up like this. You know, each pair of chromosomes just, just lines up randomly and independently of all the other pairs of chromosomes. We call this the principle of independent assortment of non-homologous chromosomes. But as a result, if they line up as they are here at the moment, you'll see that we're going to end up, when these move to opposite poles of the cell, we're going to end up with big G and little p together, and little g and big P together. So back at our Punnett square, that's what we write in here. Big P and little g together, and little p and big big G ending up together. So these really what we're drawing here, these are the four different possible combinations of alleles that we can get in the gametes when this cell here divides by meiosis. Again, this one here, when it divides by meiosis, of course, the only gametes it produces are going to be little p, little g. And we could write this out four times, but it's kind of pointless because we're just duplicating our work over and over. In any case, when fertilization happens, if this sperm fertilizes this egg, we end up with a zygote that's big P, little p, big G, little g. If this sperm fertilizes this egg, we end up with a gamete that's little p, little p, little g, little g. And notice that those are the same genotypes as the parents, and their phenotypes will be the same as well. We in fact call these phenotypes parental phenotypes. Okay, um, they're the same. You know, these ones are going to have normal skin and they'll have a normal walk, a normal gait. And these ones, just like their parent, um, their mum here, is going to have prune skin and, um, and the grasshopper gait. But what about these ones? Well, in this case, we're going to have a big P, little p, little g, little g. So this will have normal skin, but the grasshopper gait Neither of the parents is like that. And this one will be little p, little p. It'll have prune skin, but it'll have a normal gait. And again, neither of the parents are like that. So because these are new phenotype combinations, at least they're new compared to the parents, we call these recombinant phenotypes. But in any case, we've got four different phenotype combinations in a one to one to one to one ratio. Okay, equal proportions of four different phenotype combinations, that tells us that these two genes are independently assorted, that they're not linked, that those pairs of chromosomes are assorting themselves independently just as we saw. Okay, now once we know, I just want to point this out, that once we know that these two genes are independently assorted, they're not on the same chromosome, we indicate that by putting a semicolon between the two genes when we write the genotype. So that's what that means if you've seen that. Okay, let's look at what happens when two genes are linked now. So we're still going to look at the grasshopper phenotype, but this time we're going to look at a, a third phenotype, which is on the same chromosome as the grasshopper phenotype. They're both on chromosome 14. And this is, we, we call this the CSP phenotype or the craniofacial and skeletal malformation with paralysis phenotype. So these mice have this sort of weird bumpy skeleton, um, they're, they're sort of malformed skeleton, um, and often they've got paralysis as well, often their legs don't work um, normally, they can't, for some reason or another, they're sort of half paralyzed. In any case, again, this is an autosomal recessive phenotype. You'd have a mouse like the one in the picture here would have to be homozygous recessive, little c, little c. All right, so we come again to a dihybrid test cross. Again, it's a test cross, notice, because we're crossing a double heterozygote with a mouse which is homozygous recessive. But this time something's a little bit different because this time when we look at this pair of chromosomes and we imagine them dividing by meiosis, because we're simulating meiosis, remember, this time it doesn't matter what happens with chromosome 19, it can sort itself however it wants, that big C and the big G when these things sort themselves out, the big C and the big G are going together. They're stuck together. They're linked. Okay, They're a package deal. If you get the big C, you're getting the big G. If you get the little G, you're getting the little C because they're on the same chromosome together. So as a result, what we expect is big C and big G to come together and little c and little g to come together. And of course, this mouse can only produce little c, little g gametes. So we're going to get 
some gametes that are big C, little c, big G, little g, and some that are little c, little c, little g, little g. Okay, again, these are parental phenotypes. Okay, so we would expect pretty much all the babies are going to be parental phenotypes because, because these two genes are linked and these two are linked as well. Okay, you get the big C, you're getting the big G. But we still have two spaces here and, and you know, or I'm sure already, that we don't just get two phenotypes normally. And the reason for that is that sometimes at meiosis in metaphase one, when these this pair of chromosomes come together and they line up alongside each other, um, their chromatids overlap and they'll exchange pieces of themselves. We call this recombination. Um, so that when they separate at anaphase, sometimes the little g has broken off and goes with the big C and the big G, that part of that chromosome has broken off. And so the big G ends up with the little C. We'll still have some, of course, that are big C and big G and little c and little g, but now we'll have some of these recombinant gametes. Some gametes will have a big C with a little g and a little c with a big G. How many of those we get um, is of course completely dependent on how far apart the two genes are from each other. I mean, if they're, if they're you know, quite a distance apart as these are, then crossing over is often going, if crossing over happens here, they'd be separated. If it happens here, they'll be separated. If it happens here, they'll be separated. If it happens here, they won't be. If it happens here, they won't be. But if these two genes were very close together, then crossing over you know, won't separate them as often because very often the point at which they cross over will mean that the big C and the big G are still together side by side. Okay, The further apart they are, the more likely it is that the crossover point, this chiasmata, will be between those two genes. In any case, as we've just shown here, sometimes now, because of crossing over, we can get a big C with a little g or a little c with a big G. And when that happens, we can now get, of course, big C, little c, big G, little g, and little c, little c, little g, little g. These are our parental phenotypes. But sometimes now we can get big C, little c, little g, little g, and little c, little c, big G, little g. These are recombinant phenotypes. But remember, we're only going to get these ones sometimes only as a result of crossing over, okay? Only when crossing over happens between those two genes will we get these recombinant phenotypes. We'd expect to get more parental phenotypes because more of the gametes are going to have big C and big G or little c and little g because that's how they're linked, okay? So very often when we look at the results of an experiment like this, we find this sort of thing. We find that we have lots and lots of these parental phenotypes and very, very few of these recombinant ones. In fact, um, if we, let's do a little bit of maths here. If, if, I, if you add these numbers up, you'll see that I very cleverly um, made sure that they add up to 100 offspring and 6 plus 7 is 13. 13 out of 100, or if you like, 13% of the offspring are these recombinant ones. Okay, 13% of the offspring are recombinant phenotypes. What that tells us when we go back to this chromosome, what that tells us if 13% of the offspring are recombinant, that tells us that the two genes are 13 map units apart, which, you know, it varies actually because map units is, a, is a, a measure of recombination frequency, but it works out to be roughly 13 million bases of DNA apart, okay? Um, the further apart they are, the more recombination is going to happen. And again, just like before, now that we've worked out that these two genes are linked, because we didn't get a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio of four different phenotype combinations, we got mostly parental phenotypes and a few recombinant ones, because we've worked out these genes are linked, we want to write the genotype to show that. And what we do with linked genes is we go from this big C, little c, big G, little g, which just tells us tells us what alleles are there, but not, not the you know how they're linked. And we write them like this. We put the big C and the big G together because big C and big G are on the same chromosome. And we put the little c and the little g together because they're on the same chromosome. We replace our picture of chromosomes with a couple of lines, or in fact, we combine those two lines together into one line and we put it on a tilt 
because it makes it nice and easy to type. Um, and that's how we write the genotype of a heterozygous mouth, heterozygous mouse who's heterozygous at both gene loci where the big C and the big G are on the same chromosome and are linked.